Chapter 2 is finally over, and almost exactly one year from the release of my initial story video, it's finally time for me to fulfill my promise of the most requested video ever on my channel, a Fortnite storyline update. The sequence of events of Chapter 2 Seasons 5, 6, 7, and 8 have been absolutely insane and chock full with lore, some of which confirm my previous theories and others which absolutely disprove them. So here I am with all this new information, ready to craft it into a flowing narrative of the unexpected yet compelling tale of Fortnite Battle Royale. This is the Fortnite Storyline Explained. Watch it all fall! Watch it all fall! Watch it all fall! In the beginning, there was nothing. Then, suddenly an explosion of matter brought into fruition existence. We know this as the Big Bang. However, the Big Bang didn't just create our universe, it created an infinite number of universes. Different timelines, different worlds, any possibility you can think of came into creation. The responsibility for the creation of the multiverse was the zero point. The true zero point is a bridge between universes, between dimensions. Therefore, it exists beyond reality, not in any universe. However, the zero point has an outer appearance, or a shell, which can be used to access the true in-between of dimensions. This shell is what we can perceive the zero point while observing it from the outside. Think of it like a black hole. We can observe it from the outside and determine its properties from those observations, but we don't know about the true nature of these objects. However, the zero point can still be accessed through the shell. This shell of the zero point is not located in between dimensions, however, it exists in a real universe. Within that universe, there exists a planet, and on that planet, there was an island, and on that island, there was the zero point. This universe where the zero point's shell resides is called Reality Zero. Before we get into the storyline, there are several factions and concepts that will need to be explained. Of course, I can explain these things when they are first introduced in the timeline, but it's going to be a lot easier to explain the whole lore seamlessly if I just explain this stuff now. So first, we have to explain several concepts relating to the Zero Point, which are pretty imperative to the whole lore. The Zero Point, while stashed away on the island in Reality Zero, still needs a method of protection. So it trapped the island in a temporal loop of sorts, preventing the majority of people on the island from reaching the Zero Point. The loop is a temporal anomaly which can best be explained as resetting people trapped within it every 22 minutes. If anybody entered the loop from outside, they would lose their memories once trapped within. People trapped inside the loop are referred to as loopers. The loop would also manipulate the minds of loopers, making them more aggressive. The loop takes away a person's ability to speak, rendering them mute and mostly unable to communicate. As such, they would all be too focused on fighting each other instead of finding out the true nature of the island and the zero point. If a person dies within the loop, they would come back to life once it resets, but they would lose their memories from the previous iteration of the loop, and any changes they made to the island would be erased. However, while memories would be lost, feelings or emotions would be retained in between different loops. This is the zero point's defense mechanism. Take away the memories of people on the island and force them to keep killing each other over and over again. If they're thinking about that, they won't be thinking about how to reach the zero point. The way the loop would enforce this was through a hazardous storm surrounding the island. It's basically impossible to survive in the storm for an extended period of time, and over the course of 22 minutes it closes in gradually, forcing the loopers to get closer and closer together until it closes in completely at the end of 22 minutes. Despite this precaution, however, there are multiple ways to escape the loop or even just avoid entering it altogether. To escape the loop, you have to be the last person alive during one of the 22 minute iterations and stand at the eye of the storm once it closes in. If you follow these steps, a looper can escape the loop. Afterwards, they are free to stay on the island without experiencing the effects of the loop, so that means no memory loss as well as the fact that anything they build or destroy will remain permanent. The storm also doesn't affect people who've escaped the loop. However, this also means that if somebody who escapes the loop dies, they die permanently. 
As of right now, it's unclear how loopers interact with people on the island who've escaped the loop, and I can't really explain that. Hopefully we get more information about that in the future. However, something important to note is that even if you escape the loop, you're still stuck on the island, which is something we'll get into later. There are two ways people who enter the island can avoid being trapped in the loop altogether. The first is through a specially designed self-contained suit. The other way is by having a rift device, this little gun-like thingy on you. However, there is one constant across anybody living on the island. If you escape the loop, you leave behind a clone of yourself, known as a snapshot. Even if you aren't trapped in the loop and just visit the island, you'll still leave behind a snapshot of yourself once you leave the island. People who visited the island many times would leave behind many snapshots of themselves, as we'll talk about later. These snapshots, if they ever escape the loop themselves, retain their own memories, and often they even gain their own personalities, becoming their own separate person for all intents and purposes. However, since they are ultimately a snapshot, deep down they do inherently retain some of the memories of the original person they are a clone of, although they are held deep within the subconscious. Another thing to note is that it is also possible to create snapshots of objects, although this won't be used until much later. Remember the rift gun I talked about before? Yeah, it has a purpose other than just keeping its owner safe from the loop. It can be used to help open rifts or portals. The zero point, as the center of the multiverse, has the ability to travel between different universes. A portal or rift between universes that is directly derived from the zero point is known as a pure portal. These rifts are stable and controllable. The rift guns I've talked about before can be used as somewhat of a GPS. You can program the device to set coordinates of whatever reality you want to travel to within the zero point. The other type of rift are the sideways portals, which resemble cracks in space-time itself. The sideways rifts are unstable, and they will close pretty quickly. However, some of the bigger sideways rifts do end up sticking around for a bit before they destabilize. Both kinds of rifts are good ways for people to get on and off the island, but for a while, the residents of the island would not even know about them. So these are basically all the concepts you need to know. However, there are also some factions you'll need to know about beforehand to understand the story better. I'll be going over them, as well as some characters of interest. The first and most important faction is the Imagined Order, also known as IO or just the Order. IO is a military organization who are very powerful because they currently control the Zero Point. In fact, they have been around for thousands of years, secretly controlling the Zero Point from the shadows. While their reality of origin is unknown, their main base of operations, known as the bridge, is underneath the island. Most of the time, the bridge contains the zero point within it. They use the zero point for their own selfish goals by meddling and experimenting in different realities, often resulting in the disruption of the balance of multiple universes. As controllers of the zero point, they are the only ones with access to pure portals, and as such can freely travel between realities either recruiting people to work for the I.O. or straight up kidnapping them and trapping them in the loop. The I.O. runs experiments on people stuck in the loop, and they are the ones responsible for supplying the loopers with weapons as well as monitoring the storm. They have basically mastered control of the loop. They also have easy access to the surface of the island through these impenetrable bunkers, which couldn't be opened unless you played a specific frequency to act as a key. The people they bring to the island either as allies or prisoners come from many different realities, including ones that we know from TV shows or movies. Unless they do something significant, I'll most likely just ignore these people. So that's why you might see Rick Sanchez or Master Chief in one of the clips I use and I'll just seem to not acknowledge it. Moving back to the IO, their goal is to obtain more knowledge of the Zero Point, and with that knowledge comes power. They're clearly willing to do anything, even stuff that you saw was pretty ethically dubious, in order to increase their power. The list of canonical IO members is going to be way too long to explain them all, but I'll explain some of the bigger names, and if I ever have to explain another member, I'll do so when it's their part to play in the story. The first character in this faction is the field agent John Jones, the closest thing Fortnite has to a protagonist besides the unnamed player character, who to be honest is just an observer of everything. On the other hand, Jones is very much an active player. He is one of the most accomplished agents in IO's history, known for his many expeditions across different realities. He is also the first choice when IO needs to investigate something happening on the island. With the amount of times he has gone to the island, Jones has left many snapshots of himself. And as we'll talk about later, Jones does eventually defect from the Order.
The next important character is Dr. Sloane. Sloane was recruited into the Order from a young age, and she was a child prodigy, showing proficiency in both academics as well as combat. She is also absolutely ruthless, willing to do anything and work with anyone if it helps her reach her goals. She's basically borderline psychotic, viewing her subordinates as pawns and doesn't even bat an eye when they die right in front of her. After capturing Jones, she even tells him that she would enjoy torturing him. Despite some clear issues, since she was so talented, she grew up to be one of the top ranking members of IO. Even though she mostly worked in administration as an executive, she is definitely willing and capable to be an efficient leader and fighter on the battlefield. I'm hesitant to talk about the third important member because we don't know anything about him and we don't even know if they're a member of the IO in the first place, but it is theorized that an individual named Geno is the leader of the Imagined Order. This is because the Zero Point is said to be under the control of Geno. That's all we know about him, but I still wanted to include them because they're clearly an important person according to conversations characters have had about him. The next faction, and one that's arguably just as or even more important than the IO, is the Seven. The Seven, as the name suggests, are a group of seven individuals, but they do have allies. The Seven are what you could call Zero Point Conservationists. They hate that the IO are using the Zero Point for their own selfish goals, and worry that all their multiversal manipulation will result in a catastrophic destabilization of existence itself. Therefore, they've been fighting a war against the IO for many years in order to free the Zero Point from their control, and when the storyline picks up, it actually takes place after a lot of the battle has happened. We just jump in in the middle of the war. Also, the Seven are masters of using the sideways portals. Since IO is blocking access to the Zero Point directly, they use sideways rifts to travel instead. At this point in time, thanks to leaks, we actually know the name and appearances of all the Seven members. However, we only know in-depth information on four of them. The first is the Foundation. The Foundation is the leader of the Seven and firmly believes in the goals and ideology of the group, quite literally being the foundation of the group's morale and teamwork. He also suspiciously looks and sounds like Dwayne Johnson, but remember, he actually isn't Dwayne Johnson. The Foundation is a skilled combatant and is willing to do anything to protect the Zero Point, including brutally killing people and even sacrificing himself to save the Zero Point once. Next up, we've got the Visitor. We don't really know much about him, especially due to his reserved nature, making him a man of few words. According to his description, he is a navigator and explorer, and he helps the Seven plan expeditions. The third member of the Seven is the Scientist. Even less is known about him, although he certainly is talkative with a sense of humor. He's pretty technically oriented and was able to help the Visitor build a rocket as well as construct rift beacons. The fourth member is an interesting one, known as the Paradigm. She's a member who for some reason had a falling out with the rest of the Seven, and just kind of left afterwards, shunned by the group. Only the scientist has any intention of forgiving her. It's unknown what exactly she did to lose the trust of the others, but I have a hunch which I will explain later. And now we have the other three members, who aren't officially revealed yet, but the community is pretty sure that these are the other members of the Seven. The fifth member of the Seven is the Origin, and he looks like this. That's all we know about him so far. The last two members of the Seven are actually a pair, and they're just known as the Sisters. The Sisters are very interesting. If these two images are actually the Sisters, they are very different visually from the rest of the Seven. For one, they don't have the iconic helmet associated with the group, and they're a majority red, a color which we didn't see before in any of the members. On the other hand, they do share some visual similarities to the other members in their armor. According to dialogue in the game, these two are somewhere under the jurisdiction of IO, as Jones tells the Foundation he can bring him the Sisters. However, whether this means that the Sisters are prisoners of IO, or if it means that they betrayed the Seven and joined the IO, we don't know yet. The third important faction in the story is known as the Last Reality. Although we didn't know about them until very recently, they've had a presence in the story for several years. The Last Reality are a group which is dedicated to traveling across different realities and taking them over by corrupting them with dark matter. They are divided into two separate divisions, the alien-like chimeras, who are basically just a slave army, alongside the Cube Legion, which consists of cubes, fiends, and basically anything related to dark matter. Also, the weakness of the Cube Legion seems to be large amounts of water but this is somewhat contested. The last reality is led by the Cube Queen. 
These are all the major characters and factions of the Fortnite lore. The Fortnite storyline is about these different factions and their struggle over the Zero Point, as well as the people of the island who are caught in between. Now that you have the basics down, let's start explaining the storyline. We've already gone over the creation of the multiverse, so let's fast forward some several billions of years. As of right now, the island is under the control of the Imagined Order. The island itself is populated, either through loopers the IO kidnapped and sent there, or just from people native to Reality Zero that happened to live there. While many were stuck in the loop, over time people were able to escape and live normally on the island. However, escaping the loop doesn't mean escaping the island. Even if you sail to the island from the seas surrounding it, you wouldn't be able to leave. It's like a dome which you can enter but you can't escape. Remember, the people living on the island were just normal civilians, with no idea of the Zero Point or of Rifts, so they had no way to escape. However, this didn't stop some people from trying. One such example was when Renegade Raider and Aeronaut tried to escape by sailing as far away as they could. Aeronaut tried to glide past the barrier, but he got torn apart and killed once he crossed it. Geez, maybe that's why he hasn't been back in the item shop for a while. Also, just a quick side note, I find it very funny that Aeronaut's item shop description is Journey Beyond the Edge of the Sky, and years later in the comics, you can say that he died doing exactly that. Anyways, unable to escape, the people of the island would just live lives normally, becoming self-sufficient. They developed farms, energy, a functional government, housing, and eventually even entire cities. While there was suspicion about the indestructible bunkers leading to the IO base below, there wasn't much they could do to investigate, so life went on as normal. That is, until they spotted something in the sky. A meteorite was slowly getting closer and closer, and it looked like it was on a collision course with the island. Even stranger was the fact that the meteor was emitting a message in Morse code. When translated, it read, They don't want you to... The last word is most likely no. So, it looks like whoever's on the meteor wants to warn the people of someone suppressing information. Eventually, the meteor crashes down onto the island, turning Dusty Depot into a large crater. And as people suspected, the meteor had an occupant. The government quickly occupied the main crash, studying the capsule. However, the inhabitant within left and broke out of the government facility, leaving a trail of destruction behind him. The person inside the meteor was the Visitor, a member of the Seven. Of course, being the Navigator, he was the first player in this new plan of the Seven, laying out the base for what was to come. The Visitor made his way to a nearby movie set, where a fake rocket was being built. Using the anti-gravity hop rocks from within the meteor, he was able to convert the fake rocket into a functioning one. Alerts were sent out to the residents of the island, warning them of a possible attack. Eventually, the Visitor did launch the rocket, but instead of attacking anybody, he actually outfitted the rocket with technology to create large sideways rifts. We can hear this during his launch broadcast. He says that he turned something called a Zero Point Oscillator on right before opening the first rift. After creating several more rifts, the rocket flies up and creates a giant rift in the sky. Although this sideways rift was still unstable, it was still powerful enough to be more permanent. The reasons for the visitor launching the rocket are unknown. Some people believe that he was actually on the rocket and this was just a way for him to escape. However, I find this theory unlikely. My personal theory was that this was the first step in a plan to drive Io off the island, or at least to disrupt their experimentation. The rift in the sky caused realities to start merging. Things on the island started to be rifted away to other dimensions, including the Durburger mascot head, which was rifted into our reality. After a private investigation was conducted, the burger was just abandoned on some property out in the California deserts. Sometime later, a street artist who called himself Drift snuck onto the property with the intent of vandalizing the burger. Unlucky for him though, the burger was rifted back to the island on Reality Zero, and it took him along for the ride. Now stuck on the island and quickly succumbing to the effects of the loop, Drift found himself in a place which had been plunged into chaos. People and things from multiple realities were now in combat on the island most notably the entire village of Vikings. However, as he lost his memory, Drift did find new friends and once escaping the loop, he would spend some quality time with them. But the fun times didn't last forever, as soon Io would send their enforcers onto the island in order to round up anybody who was rifted there because of the visitor's actions. Io wanted complete control of the island, which meant that outside variables, stuff from other realities that they didn't want to be there, would have to be removed. 
The enforcers would hunt down Drift as well as the Vikings, but the problem with trapping people in the loop is that once they escape, they would be skilled fighters trained from fighting all the time. The enforcers had a tough time trying to remove these individuals from the island, and most were able to actually just escape their grasp. Notice that the enforcers here were using sideways portals to rift onto the island, not pure portals. This implies that Io has been losing control of the zero points, possibly due to the visitor's actions. This is good for the seven, because the less control Io has over the zero points, the easier it would be for the seven to take control of it from them. But little did neither faction know that a third enemy would soon be entering the battlefield. While all of this was happening, the rift in the sky the visitor opened was slowly destabilizing and becoming smaller. Before it completely closed, a bolt of lightning shot out and formed a cube of darkness. Looks like the island had a visitor from the last reality. The cube started to roll around the island, leaving runes in specific areas. Afterwards, the cube started rolling towards the zero point, attracted by its power. Once it reached the loot lake, it tried to go into the water, but it dissolved, turning the lake into essentially a bouncy house of dark matter. After some time, the cube built up energy and reformed lifting the small island in the middle of Loot Lake up into the sky. It created a portal to the last reality above itself, and the runes it planted on the ground became corrupted areas. And more importantly, it also opened a hole below down to the zero point. The legions of cube fiends started to attack the island and its residents. This was actually the first invasion attempt of the last reality. However, it was not the full force of the last reality, more like an attack by a scouting force. While this was happening, the cube above Loot Lake tried to corrupt the zero point by dropping its essence down into the zero point, but as a consequence, the cube itself was weakened. Eventually, the cube went all out in its attack on the zero point, causing the zero point to suck in everyone on the island. For the first time, we see the true nature of the zero point, the in-between. It creates a rift which transports us back to the island, and we see the pieces of the shattered cube lying on the ground where it once floated above. The cube had lost the battle against the zero point, and through these series of events, the last reality unknowingly helped the seven. Because of the attack on the zero point, the IO employees who inhabited the bridge had to evacuate, and for the first time in years, the seven had control over the zero point. If you think this segment about the seven seems like pure speculation, just wait because I do have evidence for it later. So now we move away from the multi-dimensional war and finally get some story about the planet the island is on. While the last reality was attempting to invade the island, there was someone watching. This someone was AIM, a robot created by someone to scout the island. AIM watched as the cube tried to take over the zero point, and he watched as the islanders fought back against the cube fiends. After the last reality was defeated, AIM reported back to his master about the powerful energy the island contained. But who was his master? To answer this question, we have to go back thousands of years. The world of Fortnite once contained great elemental kingdoms. Eventually, these kingdoms broke out into war, and the Fire Kingdom would quickly rise to dominance in the battle and defeat most of the other kingdoms. The only kingdom left fighting against the Fire Kingdom was, ironically, the Ice Kingdom. The Ice King knew that the Fire Kingdom would be a difficult force to defeat, and doing so would require great sacrifice. In one last attack, the Ice King led his armies to capture the Fire King. He then imprisoned the Fire King deep within the dungeons of his castle. But this was not enough. The Fire King would simply start to melt through his prison. Therefore, the Ice King made the ultimate sacrifice and put himself as well as his entire castle into a deep freeze, putting both himself and the Fire King into a frozen slumber, intending to never wake up. Thousands of years passed, and the events of the Elemental War have mostly been forgotten, lost to legend. In what used to be the Ice Kingdom, there lived a brilliant inventor named Sergeant Winter, he was able to invent the X4 Stormwing as well as the AIM robots we talked about before. He sent the AIM robots out into the world to explore for better land to occupy, as the current frozen landscape was hard to thrive in. One of these robots was sent to explore the island, and after witnessing the power of the Zero Point, Sergeant Winter wanted it for himself. He built giant engines to move the land itself and sail it across the ocean to the island. He eventually reached the island alongside his massive chunk of land he brought unknowingly trapping everybody on it inside the loop. However, since Sergeant Winter was a genius and physically strong, it did not take long for him to escape. He started a full-blown invasion of the island, using his planes and soldiers to create military bases across the island. Despite this, the islanders were able to fight back against the invasion. However, Sergeant Winter had unknowingly made a grave mistake. 
The land he brought to the island included the ruins of the Ice King's castle. Since this chunk of land was now in a temperate climate rather than a polar one, the ice began to melt. And within his icy dungeon, the Fire King awoke and began to melt the ice faster using his powers. And as the ice melted, the Ice King also woke. He knew something was seriously wrong. Because if he woke up, that means his measures to keep the Fire King contained had failed. He quickly searched for a way to reverse the melting. Finding a shard of the cube at Loot Lake, he brought it back to his castle and used it to help increase his power. After several days of building up power using the shard, he then covered the island in a deep freeze like he did to his own kingdom thousands of years ago. was taken too late. The Fire King had escaped and he was on a quest to increase his power as well. He used a thermal energy found deep within the earth and as a result caused devastating earthquakes. Finally, after some time building up his power at Weeping Woods, he reached his full capacity and built a new home for himself by literally raising a volcano out of the ground, causing the surrounding area to take on a tropical climate. He also took some eggs which were also in the Ice King's dungeon and these eggs hatched into hybrids, a species of lizard-human hybrids. He raised these hybrids to serve him as his minions. With all this, the preparations were set for him to take revenge upon the Ice King. While this was happening, the people of the island realized that there was something very important under Loot Lake, since many groups were trying to get under it. They organized an excavation team to dig out the area, and they found... a vault? This was surprising to everyone, and naturally, efforts were made to open it. All the keys necessary to open the vault were found, and after they were activated, the vault opened. People dropped in, and they were once again met with the Zero Point. The vault which the Zero Point was held in was quite strange. It contained items which had previously seemingly disappeared from reality. They also saw a desk in front of the Zero Point with a helmet on it, but the wearer was currently gone. This helmet belonged to Singularity. Singularity was actually a member of the Seven, taking on the codename The Paradigm when working with them but she is just referred to as Singularity otherwise. She was put in charge of watching over the Zero Points by the Seven after they gained control of it. The reason why I think the Seven are currently in control of the Zero Point is because of its appearance. Compared to how Io contained it in a military facility, the Zero Point currently looks much more free and in a natural environment. This more free environment lines up with the Seven's ideology when it comes to the Zero Point. Anyways, after stealing the drum gun from the vault, the Islanders are brought back to the surface of the island and they are met with a horrifying sight. While the islanders were busy exploring the vault, the Fire King enacted his plan for revenge against the Ice King. He caused his volcano to erupt, launching several rocks towards the Ice King's castle, several miss and hit residential areas like Retail Row and Tilted Towers, completely destroying them. However, one does hit close to the target, striking the iceberg right below the castle. While this may seem like a miss, we will soon learn that the Fire King was right on target. Satisfied with what he had done, the Fire King's need for revenge was fulfilled. However, his actions had caused devastation to the residents of the island. Feeling pity towards them, Singularity, or the Paradigm, I'll be referring to her using both interchangeably from now on, decided to help them rebuild. She broke the Seven's ideology and allowed the people to use the Zero Point's energy to power the island. This new, unlimited source of energy allowed the island to make rapid technological advances. Tilted and Retail were rebuilt into cities of the future. Fast and free public transportation was installed. After such a catastrophe, life finally seemed to be getting better for the islanders. To honor the paradigm and thank her for her help in rebuilding the island, the people constructed a massive statue of her in the central square of Neo Tilted. However, little did they know that soon, they would be needing her help more than ever. The Fire King's attack on the Ice King's castle seemed to miss, but the part of the glacier that it hit started to break apart. And trapped within the ice, a giant eye started to move. The Fire King was not the only being the Ice King captured, and this monster would be a much bigger threat. The monster, known as the Devourer, left the glacier and escaped to the ocean. However, it was spotted circling the island's waters, so it was only a matter of time before it came back to attack. 
The islands scramble to create a countermeasure, and what better way to defend against a giant monster than a giant mech? With all the island's resources used for the defense effort, the mech was quickly built, and Singularity would be the one to pilot it. The day the island had been dreading arrived, and a devourer arose from the ocean, firing a beam of energy. It made its way to the zero point and started battering the vault, hoping to break it open. Singularity pilots the mech out of its hangar and fires a barrage of missiles at the devourer, getting its attention. The devourer fires a beam back at the mech, knocking it down. Singularity gets up and charges the devourer, knocking them both into the ocean. Singularity emerges, seemingly victorious, but the devourer leaps out of the ocean and attacks the mech, ripping out its arm and throwing it into the ocean. Singularity is able to throw the devourer off of her, but her mech was seriously damaged. As her last resort, she goes to the vault, breaks it open with a punch, and brings out the zero point. After absorbing some of its power, Singularity throws a mean right hook at the devourer, stunning it. She then walks over to Neo Tilted, grabbing the statue of herself, pulling it out and revealing that the statue was just the hilt of a giant sword. The devourer and the mech lunged at each other one last time, and Singularity drove her sword into the devourer's skull. Even though she had come out victorious, Singularity knew she had completely messed up. She had forsaken her duties as a member of the Seven, and had damaged the Zero Point to the brink of collapse. She knew the Seven would be extremely upset at her for being responsible for exposing and losing control of the Zero Point, but she did go to them for help in controlling the situation. Meanwhile, on the island, the Zero Point continued to destabilize. Realities began to merge and make their way onto the island. For example, the crater at Dusty Divot was sent back in time to right before the meteor crashed into it, bringing back Dusty Depot but also leaving the meteor in suspension above it. The floating island created by the cube also returned, but this cube came from a reality where it lifted up the motel instead of Loot Lake. With the multiverse destabilizing, the Seven decided to step in once more and clean up after the Paradigm's failure. The people sent were the Scientist, Visitor, and Paradigm. They created Rift Beacons as a sort of controlled demolition. Rather than having realities spill over uncontrollably, these rift beacons acted like a dam, allowing reality to destabilize slower and in limited areas, replacing only those locations with alternate dimensions. Through the time they gained through this method, the scientist, visitor, and paradigm realized that the only way to fix the exposed zero point would be a hard reset. They had come up with a plan to perform this reset, but there was one problem. In order to do it, they had to be inside the loop. To prepare entering the loop, they left behind audio tapes for themselves, which gave background and instructions to their future selves for executing the plan. Here is what they said. What the seven of us are attempting is very risky. I suspect they are not the only ones watching, but it must be done or we lose the bridge forever. I speculate that no one calculated the formation of the island that interdimensional matter collisions would resolve rather than push. Now that I witnessed it firsthand, it's obvious that pinching alone made it inevitable. When I hear this again, will it help me remember? Or once looped, will I be just as muted as the others? No matter, it seems the lengthy precautions worked. The Black Theorem was a success. I, us, you, arrived outside the loop at the exact moment of expansion, this effectively paused the singularity, giving us time to create the devices needed to synchronize the junction. What I didn't factor was that the only way to trigger the device was from within the loop itself. Thus this, thus this hasty and primitive recording. And why now you, I, find myself looped. Activate the beacon at precisely the moment this timer reaches nothing. The zero point must be contained once more. If they are correct, it will be the end. As we saw, this was a last resort plan to keep the bridge and the zero point under their control. It involved resetting the zero point from inside the loop and creating a new island, with the zero point being reborn and healed in its new home. Eventually, the plan was executed and the Seven launched a rocket from Dusty Depot, immediately creating a rift in the sky. Six other snapshots of the rocket were created and they all coordinated to break the meteor, which was suspended above Dusty Depot, out of its stasis. The meteor fell into a rift. One of the rockets rifted above the zero point, targeted it, and flew down into it, weakening it further.
The meteor also rifted above the zero points, and guided by the six other rockets, it fell down into the zero points, crashing into it. The Zero Point fought back, but in its weakened state, its defenses couldn't hold, and it collapsed into a black hole, sucking the entirety of the island in. But as quickly as the island disappeared, it was reborn. A whole new land, created by rearranging the matter of the old island, and the zero point was once again contained in the bridge. However, it had once again fallen into the hands of the IO after the reformation, meaning that while they had saved the zero point, the seven had also lost it. Due to the catastrophic series of events caused by the paradigm, she left the seven. Whether she was forced to by the other members, or whether she decided to leave herself because she was ashamed, it is unknown. Meanwhile, on the island, the people living on it were extremely confused as to what happened, but grateful to be alive. A group of islanders formed a reconnaissance group called Ego to explore the new island, and even though they crashed their plane initially, this recon team was successful, establishing bases across the new island. However, the Ego squad found something horrifying. An underground criminal organization named Alter had been growing in the seedy underbelly of the island, and its members were none other than the snapshots of the Ego team. The leader of this team was the Chaos Agent, the owner of the company Kevolution Energy, which owned a power plant run by the essence of the Darkness Cubes. He had purposefully hired snapshots to work for him in order to sow confusion in the upcoming battles, and he was told to do this by none other than his secret boss, Midas. Midas was a wealthy billionaire with some previous ties to IO, as seen in this image depicting him watching Dr. Sloan. It is unknown if the Midas in the story is the same person as the Midas in this image, or if the story Midas is just a snapshot of the original Midas. Anyways, Midas had the ability of the Golden Touch, just like his namesake. However, he could control this ability unlike the mythical Midas. The origins of this power is unknown, but it likely has something to do with the skeleton king Oro. Using his Golden Touch power as well as some smart business tactics, Midas grew very wealthy and influential on the island controlling it from his massive office known as the Agency, found at the center of the island. He knew that the island was under the influence of the loop and wanted to use the resources at his disposal to destroy the loop and free the island. But he knew that Io was watching, and that they wouldn't tolerate any attempt to disrupt their cruel experiments. He needed a major distraction to keep Io's eyes away from his plan to escape the loop. Seeing the Ego group grow in influence, he asked his subordinate Chaos Agent to create a group named Alter which would oppose the Ego group. Midas' distraction would be an all-out war on the island. Midas was notable for having a large team of spies at his disposal, and he used them to watch the development of the conflict. Whenever Ego and Alter fought, Midas' spies were watching. However, the current conflict was too small to serve as a distraction, and Midas wanted it to escalate. He sent his spies to infiltrate both organizations, and he instructed them to encourage their respective organizations to be more aggressive in the fight. Midas himself joined Ego, what started as isolated battles soon turned into a massive war engulfing the island. The distraction was set. Midas believed the key to breaking the loop could be found in the storm which engulfed the island every 22 minutes. He was right, the storm was the main driving factor of the loop. He then theorized that if he created a machine to somehow break the storm, then the loop would be broken as a result. However, to create such a machine, he would need a master engineer. Lucky for him, he didn't need to look any further than his own daughter. Jules was the daughter of Midas, a skilled engineer who didn't want to flaunt her father's wealth, and rather decided to make a living independence of him. So she practiced and became a skilled engineer, 
working for Alter during the war. Midas reached out to her and asked for her help in creating the storm-breaking device. Jules agreed, but only if Midas gave something in return. Despite her efforts to distance herself from her father, it looks like ambition runs in the family, since Jules asked that influence over the island be given to her. While this meant that Midas would effectively give up all of his power, he agreed because he wanted that device more than anything. Jules began working on the device, and Midas told his agents in the altar to promote Jules to a leadership position. He also manipulated the war so that Alter would be set to win, which would make Jules a powerful leader on the island after the war. As promised, Jules finished the device. She also built a suit for her father, a self-contained suit similar to the Seven, so even though he wasn't looped, he would be protected from any tricks the storm had up his sleeve. The device would only work in a storm cycle where the eye was censored on the agency, so he did have to wait quite a bit. Eventually, the day Midas was anticipating arrived, and he activated his device. The initial activation was enough to blow up his entire agency, but Midas didn't care. This was the day he finally got to escape the island. The device rose up out of the ground, as well as multiple pillars in the water surrounding the agency. It powered up, and using each of those pillars as a power boost, the device sent out beams of energy into the storm, and for the first time ever, the storm was pushed back. And Midas was right, this seemed to break the loop because loopers were sent to the bridge, with some even finding themselves inside John Jones's office. We see here that Io was still suspicious of Midas, because on John Jones's desk were case files on Midas, Jules, and some of Midas's agents. But our stay in his office wasn't permanent, and the loopers were sent back to the island. The device flickered off, losing its power. The storm tried extra hard to fight back against the device, raging more than we had ever seen it before. But the device powered up and pushed through once more, and was able to drive the storm all the way back, dissipating it. And for a moment, the island was peaceful. But the loopers are once again transported to the bridge, where we see Io employees in a panic state, quickly trying to think of a solution to Midas' device. However, since the device's power still wasn't enough, we were transported back to the agency, where we were met with a giant circular wall of water enclosing us. Io had to think of a quick solution to the storm disappearing, and decided to fill where the storm should be with water. The Io had succeeded in stopping Midas' plan, but for one time, the loopers were transported to the bridge. We hear John Jones talking on the phone, relieved that their plan worked. He opens the door and sees a looper inside of his office. Completely stunned, he asks us how we got there, and before we get sent back, he asks one more question. Wait, wait. Can you, can you hear me? Hear me? Hear me? Hear me? Hear me? The Io knew the wall of water was just a temporary solution. Once the storm was functioning again, the wall of water collapsed, flooding the island. In this new hierarchy, Midas was no longer king, and he had made many enemies. He went into hiding near the edge of the island, floating adrift on a raft. He was then attacked by a shark. Whether he lived or died, nobody knew. Meanwhile, the island had recovered from the actions of Midas. Jules took over the ruins of the agency and turned it into her own base, the Authority. Alter ruled the island, but Ego spearheaded a resistance from an ocean base called the Fortilla. However, without the manipulation of Midas, the war quickly died down and the two sides made peace. Eventually, the water receded and life went back to normal. Well, life can never be normal for too long in Reality Zero. A rift appeared and dropped an object, creating a crater in the ground. This object was... Thor's hammer? Let's go back in time a bit. When the Seven launched a rocket to reset the zero point, the energy of that reset was felt across different universes. One being who felt this energy was Galactus from one of the Marvel timelines. Wanting that power for himself, he started to travel to the island, somehow traveling to Reality Zero. However, since Thor, who was acting as a herald of Galactus, was faster, he was able to reach the island through a rift before Galactus, before he was able to pass through. He wanted to warn the people of the island of Galactus' arrival, as well as prepare a defense to stop him. Before the memory loss of the loop took over, he used the Bifrost to bring many superheroes to the island, most notably Tony Stark. While all of them were initially trapped within the loop, having the abilities and powers that they have, they had no problem escaping. They all got to work figuring out a plan to stop Galactus from devouring the Zero Point. This plan relied heavily on Stark, who spent his time studying the Zero Point, the loop, and snapshots, 
found a way to use snapshots in order to create millions of copies of the battle bus within the zero coins. These buses were outfitted with gamma bombs, and Stark believed that if Galactus ate enough of them, once detonated it would create enough energy to send him back to the universe where he came from, alongside all the other Marvel characters. Galactus came to the island and he was absolutely monstrous, towering over everything else in sight. He brought out the zero points from within the island and began consuming it, leading it to suck everyone on the island like in the event back when the cube tried to destroy the zero points. Once again, we were within the zero points, witnessing its true form. Galactus started to feast on the zero points, but the millions of battle buses made their way into Galactus's mouth. Okay, so I took the liberty of tinkering with your reality a bit? It's really no big deal. You can thank me later. I hacked your time loop thingy, uh, made a few billion battle bus clones, and then turned them all into very powerful bombs. We need to get Galactus to eat as many buses as possible before he's done with the zero point. If everything goes right, it'll open a portal and send him back where he came from. The bombs were all detonated, creating a rift back to his original timeline, which he was then forced into. Successful, the Marvel heroes return to their home and we return to Reality Zero. But since the Zero Point was once again exposed and damaged, another destabilization of reality was underway. With the IO and damage control mode, John Jones gets a call from Dr. Sloan. She's worried about more people escaping the loop and tells Jones to keep people within the loop no matter what. In return, the IO would attempt to mitigate the destabilization of the Zero Point. After some argument, Jones agrees. He locates the best hunters across all realities and opens pure portals to these realities with these hunters. He then spends most of his time on a mission to recruit these hunters and bring them to Reality Zero to prevent loopers from escaping. Meanwhile, Io sends enforcers up to the surface of the island in order to keep the islanders under control. After bringing all of these different hunters to the island, Jones was upset after finding out that Io had done nothing to repair the damages done to the Zero Point. Even worse, his mission to get all the hunters from different realities damaged the zero points even more. Reality log, man. Does it even matter? What's the point of recording these logs if you're not gonna listen? We've lost control of the zero point. Do, do you get what that means? You must not because you're doing nothing. I've dedicated my life to the order. I've given everything. And for what? To just sit back and watch reality end? That's not who we are. At least it's not who I am. Not anymore. And with Io being unwilling to do anything, Jones would seek the help of those he knew would help him fix the zero point, the Seven. This is Agent Jones requesting access to Restricted File 8752. This is Agent Jones requesting access to Restricted File 8752. Oh, really? <laughs> no time to stabilize reality, but plenty of time to revoke my credentials. This is Agent Jones requesting access to all materials related to the Seven. Oh, great! Okay, if you're not going to give me what I need, I'm just going to have to take it. With the zero points on the verge of collapse, Jones makes a decision to defect from the imagined order and go to the Seven for help. He sets his rift gun to the last known location of the Seven and throws it into the zero points, opening a portal. And the person to come out was none other than the leader of the Seven, the Foundation. Seeing Jones, the Foundation immediately attacks him, still thinking that he was working for IO. Jones gets him to stop by saying that he could get him to Geno. The Foundation also asks if he could get him to the sisters, and Jones agrees as long as the Foundation helps him fix the Zero Points. Geno! I can get you to Geno. And the sisters? I can get you all of them. But I need your help to fix that. You have a deal. For now. Oh, that's very reassuring. The Foundation says yes, and he tasks Jones, as well as an Islander, to close the various portals which have opened around the island while he investigates the Zero Point. The Foundation warns that the Zero Point would create reality waves, which would change the island drastically every time that happens. Jones becomes a rift butterfly, and we keep transforming into different people. We are tasked with closing the different portals across the island with Jones's rift gun as reality waves keep rocking us. We finish closing all the portals, but it still isn't enough. The Zero Point begins to bloom, 
and the damage is too much as it starts to fall apart, turning red. The Foundation realizes the only way to save the Zero Point would be to seal it with him inside. Jones takes us to the Foundation, where a massive spire was being formed around the Zero Points. The purpose of the spire would be to contain the Zero Point as it healed, and eventually transfer it back underground where it should be. However, in order to complete the process, Jones needed to overload his Rift Gun and throw it into the Zero Points. Without his Rift Gun, Jones would be trapped within the loop. The Foundation tells him that both of them would have to fight their way back, and that he would find Jones and make him fulfill his promise to give him Geno and the sisters. Jones promises that he would, and he overloads his gun and throws it into the Zero Point, completing the sealing process, trapping the Foundation inside the Spire and Jones within the loop. Thanks to the actions of both Jones and the Foundation, the Zero Point has been saved, and now the story splits into multiple threads. The creation of the Spire caused the island to go primal. The Zero Point healing allowed life to flourish across the island, and wildlife thrived like never before. A cult dedicated to the Spire rose to prominence, and it looked like they were allied with the IO, trying to prevent any islanders from getting too close to the Spire. They were led by the Spire Assassin, who lived at the Spire and would attack anybody who got too close to it. No exceptions. However, there was one person willing to defy them. This man was named Raz. Raz was someone who was drawn by the power of the Spire, and wanted to uncover the mystery behind it. He hired islanders to investigate the crystals found embedded in the Spire, and found that they were emanating a humming which could possibly be translated. Raz got to work on creating a device which could translate the crystal frequencies from the Spire. He completes work on his device, and once activating it, he learns that the sound played in the crystals is a repeating message from the Foundation, his voice saying, Jones knows. Even though the actual John Jones was missing, Raz decides to track down all the snapshots of Jones in the island to see if they have any knowledge that could be useful. Now, moving on to the second plot thread found in the comics. Sometime after the Spire was created, a rift was created in Gotham City. The rift leading to Reality Zero sucked in some notable characters, including the Caped Crusader himself. Batman finds himself on the island, stuck within the loop. He quickly discovers that he lost his memory and that he couldn't speak. He also finds out that feelings do transfer over between loop iterations, finding Catwoman and allying himself with her, even though neither of them understood how they knew each other. After several iterations of the loop, Batman would leave himself notes and hints etched into his armor, which would help him further investigate the loop and find allies. Eventually, he figures out that the way to escape the loop would be through standing at the center of the storm while being the last person alive. Catwoman is able to escape, and eventually Batman himself is able to escape as well. He is met with a group of islanders who are also on a mission to escape the island itself. This group consisted of Raider, Bonehead, Fishthick, Bandolette, Magnus, and Voyager, as well as Catwoman, Deathstroke, and Batman himself. Together, they came up with a plan to escape the island. After seeing the Zero Point open pure portals previously, the islanders believed that getting to the Zero Point was the key to getting off the island. However, since the Spire Assassin would attack anybody who got close, they believed trying to access it would, that way would be fruitless. Instead, they would turn their eyes to the various bunkers on the island, knowing that there had to be something underneath. Although the islanders said that the bunker was impenetrable, Batman claimed that they were unlocked through a certain frequency. He crafts devices capable of recording and replaying frequencies. He tasks all the members of his group to go around the island with these devices and record every frequency they find. Batman thought if they collect as many frequencies as possible, one of them has to unlock the bunkers. His hunch was correct, and they do end up unlocking the bunker. Fishstick was sent to scout for any traps while the rest ventured down into the bunker. After fighting against golems, they find themselves in an IO storage room which seems to have collapsed in. After digging through some rubble, they found Fishstick, gravely burned and injured. Before dying, he gives Batman an IO gadget that he found, which is part of the rift gun used to protect someone from the loop. They go further into the bridge facility, fighting against IO agents sent to stop them. But they were able to fight through the waves of soldiers sent against them and made their way to the Zero Point room. The Zero Point, once again underground, was right in front of them. Home was right in front of them. Voyager, getting excited, rushed the Zero Point and jumped in without thinking, but he was ripped apart and instantly killed. Batman postulates that if the Zero Point is the center of all reality, it was most likely flickering through millions of different realities every second, and as a result, jumping in would cause you to be scattered across millions of realities, like what had happened to Voyager. They realized that in order to make their way home, they needed to somehow calibrate the Zero Point to their specific dimension to successfully escape. They were able to figure out how to use the IO terminal to successfully calibrate the Zero Point, and after years of being trapped on the island, Raider was finally able to go home. 
After this, Batman called out Deathstroke for being the one who killed Fishstick, since the burns on Fishstick's body matched Deathstroke's attack. Deathstroke committed to working with the IO to monitor this group of islanders, but he also agreed to let everyone go back home since they all needed to work as a team to return. Bandelet, Bonehead, and Magnus all returned to their homeworlds, but surprise, Deathstroke betrayed them again, revealing that he had a rift gun in his possession which he could use to get back home by himself. He jumps into the zero point, leaving the other two stranded since they needed three people to man the portal. Batman and Catwoman knew that they recognized another woman within the loop, so they returned to the surface of the island and found her, Harley Quinn. Surprisingly enough, she actually wasn't looped, but just stayed and fought because she found it fun. Batman and Catwoman kidnap her and take her back to the zero point, where they successfully were able to open a portal to Gotham. Harley escapes, claiming that she would just rather stay on the island, and Batman and Catwoman return to Gotham, going their separate ways. Meanwhile in Metropolis, within Lex Luthor's office, it is revealed that Dr. Sloan enlisted the help of him, Deathstroke, and the Batman who laughs. She wanted to plant an anchor device within the Zero Point in order to use its power remotely, and had to contract with these people in order to do that job for her. In return, she would have to hold up her end of the deal, which she promises she will do. Back on the island, Raz's search for answers through John Jones' snapshots turned out mostly empty. He and the islanders he hired talked to most of them, but basically none of them had any information of use. After all, as snapshots, they don't retain much memory of their original person. However, there were two snapshots which did offer up useful information, Dark Jonesy and Jonesy the First. Dark Jonesy was a snapshot of Jones who was left behind after Jones was sent to investigate the original cube which landed on the island. He knew about scrolls, which Io possessed that spoke about spirit artifacts that when charged, could give great power. Raz finds one of these scrolls and reads it to learn that one of these powerful artifacts was being guarded by a Despire assassin. The scroll also said that in order to power up this artifact, it required the energy from human sacrifice. So close to completing his quest for understanding the Spire, he set out to find and kill the Spire assassin. Meanwhile, an islander he hired would talk to Jonesy I, who was a snapshot of Agent Jones created after his first ever mission to the island. After some persuasion, Jonesy I tells the islander that the Spire will indeed grant immense power and knowledge, but it will also exploit one's every weakness and corrupt them. After telling Jonesy that Raz was out to learn the secrets of the Spire, he tells us to hurry and stop him before he becomes corrupted, and that his power would attract unwanted attention from someone. But we don't know yet. We go to the Spire and find that the worst has happened. Raz had killed the Spire Assassin and taken her artifact, which was actually a shard of the cube. After powering the artifact with the lives of people he killed, Raz had become extremely powerful, but he had also been corrupted by the artifact turning him into the Glyph Master Raz, and Jonesy the First's warnings were correct. Raz activating the Spire Artifact basically sent out a beacon across realities, and alerted none other than the Last Reality. The Last Reality began to send Chimera scouts to the island, prepping for a proper invasion this time around instead of just sending a single cube like last time. The Chimera would discreetly scout the island, abducting islanders and leaving crop circles. A conspiracy theorist named Mari created a podcast called Hot Saucers to discuss the alien encounters and broadcasted it across the island. While initially skeptical of the hostility of the aliens, she starts to believe that the aliens are actually friendly and spreads this belief on her podcast. This results in a lot of the island adopting this pro-alien mindset and many people actually began to welcome a potential invasion. Of course, Dr. Sloan knows that any alien showing up are probably a threat to the Zero Points and orders Mari to stop her broadcast to stop spreading misinformation. Mari, of course, refuses. More questions! Dr. Sloan from the I.O. has this to say. Cease all communications with and discussion of alien matters immediately. Uh-oh, sounds like someone knows something. Well, tell me who you are and what the I.O. is and maybe we'll have a deal. Hey, look, uh, if you know who this Sloan weirdo is, can you message me? She will not back off, and she is really freaking me out. Seriously. Please. Eventually, the last reality ordered the Chimera to begin the full-scale invasion, sending in a mothership and a lot of supporting ships that swarmed the island, while Islanders party to celebrate the arrival of the aliens. The mothership positions itself above the spire, still believing the Zero Point to be within it. They destroy it with a giant laser, attempting to absorb the Zero Point's energy, but they fail. However, the weapon the aliens used was so powerful it sent shockwaves across the island, including within the bridge, where the Zero Point was actually contained. 
and the foundation, still trapped within the zero point, was finally broken free. If you remembered, the most recent reality the zero point was calibrated to was Gotham, when Batman and Catwoman escaped. Since the zero point was calibrated to this reality, when the foundation was broken free, he entered this reality and fell into the oceans off of Gotham. However, after months holding the zero point together, he was unconscious. Holding the zero point together, he was unconscious, and he sank to the bottom of the sea, clearly not waking up anytime soon. Back on the island, the Chimera had started an all-out war. They had started a campaign to take it over, and had already invaded and terraformed locations like Holly Hedges. They also had the foresight to take over the enemy from within, sending disguised aliens to infiltrate the Io and damage them from the inside. Io had decided to intervene and fight back directly. They set up bases across the island, and their main base of operations was in a facility underneath Corny Complex. After witnessing the destructive power of the Chimera firsthand, Sloan herself took command of the battlefield, leading troops in battle against the Chimera. And in a victory for her, the Io had found John Jones himself on the island after months of him being missing. They imprisoned him within the bridge deep underground. However, Jones' defection also inspired others to defect. They would go against the Io from within their ranks. There was also one defector who seemingly leaked information to the Chimera. While defecting from the Io is understandable, I still don't understand why someone would help the aliens actively try to destroy your home. Maybe this person thought that the Chimera would win and help them hoping that they could be spared? Maybe this person was just a massive troll. We'll never really know their motivation. Io was very harsh on eliminating this mole. They had found other defectors within their ranks and killed them, but the mole was still leaking information to the Chimera. Eventually, the mole's identity would be discovered. She was Maven. However, instead of killing her immediately, Sloane decided to allow her to leak misinformation to the Chimera. She allowed Maven to tell them that Io's main base was under Corny Complex, and that destroying it would guarantee victory. While this was not entirely false, Sloane had a trick up her sleeve. During the war, the Chimera had been destroying entire locations by abducting them into the mothership. This had happened to Coral Castle and Slurpy Swamp. However, Sloane intended to set a trap for the Chimera. By allowing Maven to tell the Chimera about where the Io's main base was, she could guarantee that they would attempt to abduct Corny Complex into the mothership. Of course, this was a trap, and she ordered bombs to be planted all over Corny Complex. Once the aliens abducted the location, the bombs would be inside the mothership, and it would be blown apart from the inside. This was a pretty flawless plan, but there was one issue. Once the bombs were inside the mothership, there would be no way to detonate them from outside. A team would be required to enter the ship, activate the bomb's timer, and escape quickly before they detonated. This would be the most difficult part of the plan. The strike team was assembled, and the mission was all set to go forward. It was codenamed Operation Skyfire. The day came when the aliens would finally abduct Corny Complex into the mothership. The strike team nervously waited, knowing that this was a dangerous mission. But they had Dr. Sloan at their back, who promised them that she would be able to hack into the mothership's door system to support them. What could go wrong? The team was abducted into the mothership. Operation Skyfire was a go. Sloan would open the doors of the abduction cells they were held in, allowing them to escape and head towards a place where they could activate the bombs and leave. However, they were spotted by a Chimera saucer, who then set off an alarm. Chimera squads were sent to stop the team, but Sloan would be able to close off their access and find a safe path through the ship. Using a transport chute, the team found themselves in a room next to the abducted location. The process to arm the bombs began, but the signal was quickly disrupted. Turning around to see what caused it, we are horrified to find a cube forming in the middle of the room. Realizing that the Chimera had failed to stop the strike team, the last reality decided to send one of their own to finish us off. Sloane was horrified to see this. She said that the last time the cube was on the island, it nearly destroyed it. She thought that the cube had been destroyed, but here it was again. The cube started sending out bolts of lightning, killing a significant chunk of the strike team, but Sloane, through some quick thinking, was able to force the devices the strike team wore to release a synchronized burst of energy, which killed the cube. Luckily, after taking care of this obstacle, there were enough of the strike team left to arm the bombs, which they did. Unlucky for the strike team, however, after they armed the bombs, Sloane dropped a bombshell on them. She said that she wouldn't be bringing them home, leaving them to die. She said that it was necessary, because she didn't want any chance of the cube coming back to the island, as the consequences of such a thing happening would be dire. 
She tells the team that their sacrifice would be honored before breaking communication with them. With nothing else they could do in the less than two minutes before the bombs detonated, what was left of the strike team went over to the dead cube. I don't really know what happened next. Maybe there was an empathy from the team members to the cube, knowing all of them shared the tragic fate of being killed by Sloan. Maybe it was the power of friendship. But somehow, the team members were able to reboot the dead cube. But it was different this time. It had turned blue. It had become a purified cube. The room we were in started to elevate, taking us to an absolutely massive chamber on the upper level of the mothership. Seriously, this chamber was probably as big as the entire island. The chamber was initially pitch black, only lit up by the glow of patrolling abductors. But the team watched in horror as another cube, a corrupted cube, rose up in front of them. And another one. And another one. And suddenly, the entire room started to glow with the purple light of thousands of cubes, with keen eyes being able to spot a golden cube far in the distance. This was the true last reality, the Cube Legion. The golden cube in the distance was the Cube Queen, and they had fooled the IO, not the other way around. Dr. Sloan had made a grave mistake. She had assumed that there was only one cube, and that the bombs would destroy it. But now that there were thousands of them, when the mothership blew up, there would certainly be surviving cubes which fell onto the island. The countdown hit zero, and explosions rocked the mothership. We see that the abductors and a significant chunk of the cubes were destroyed, but as the strike team fell from the sky, they watched as many cubes rain down onto the island, including the blue one. As they looked up at the debris and cubes falling, they realized that the mission was ultimately a failure. While they had succeeded in destroying the mothership, they had fallen for the last reality's trap. The last reality had sacrificed the Chimera Legion so that the cubes would be able to fall into the island after the explosion. The Chimera were defeated, but now we would have to deal with their masters. Let's go back to the Foundation. After months unconscious under the water, the Foundation finally woke up. He swam out of the water and started walking towards Gotham City. Meanwhile, in Metropolis, the Justice League were fighting several villains after a rift had appeared there. Remember Dr. Sloan's agreement with Lex Luthor? Well, apparently her side of the agreement would be to allow him to enter Reality Zero to study the Zero Points, but we'll get to that later. While the Justice League are fighting the villains in Metropolis, Batman decides to go back to Gotham to see if there was anything going on there. He meets the Foundation, and after a short fight, they realize that both of them are enemies with the IO and they strike a truce. When Batman tells him about the rift that had opened, the Foundation says that it's actually possible to close it. He gives Batman a device, similar to IO's rift gun, and explains that if two people on both sides of the rift activated at the same time, the rift would be closed. The two joined the fight back in Metropolis, with the Foundation hoping that he could use the rift to get back to Reality Zero. Lex Luthor appears in an airtight suit he had spent time developing. It was similar to the Foundation suit, so he could enter the island without being affected by the loop. However, the Foundation cracks his visor, forcing him to retreat, since he would be looped if he entered the rift now. The Foundation is then tackled by the Batman who laughs into the rift. Before he enters, the Foundation tells Batman to wait for his signal to activate the device. Now in Reality Zero, the Batman who laughs and Foundation fight. Batman who laughs uses his metal visor to crack Foundation's helmet. Even though the suit has an auto repair feature, the time it would take so would be too long, as the Foundation would be overtaken by the loop. But at the last second, the Foundation defeated the Batman who laughs and told Batman to close the rift. Now with the rift closed, and with Foundation being the only one left alive at the middle of the storm, he doesn't have to worry about being looped anymore, and the Batman who laughs was taken care of, now trapped in the loop. However, he had come back to an island in chaos. Dr. Sloan had intended to end the last reality, but in reality, she gave them the perfect opportunity to attack. The aftermath of Operation Skyfire left the island covered in the last reality's cubes. The cubes would corrupt the area around them, just like the original cube did with its runes. And this corrupted land would create areas known as sideways bubbles. Let me explain. The last reality is an invading force of darkness which originates in a single reality. They consist of their leader, the Cube Queen, and her army, which includes these cubes, fiends, brutes, and caretakers. However, other than the cubes, the last reality cannot survive in environments other than the one they come from. While the lesser fiends can survive in the cube's corrupted environment, the elite army the Cube Queen employs cannot survive in any differing condition. As a result, in order to move her army to a different reality, she would need to send the cubes first to create areas known as the sideways. These would be bubbles of safety for the elite fiends and caretakers. 
In order to completely invade the world, the last reality would have to engulf the entire island in these sideways bubbles. So the first stages of the takeover was happening in Reality Zero. Reality Zero was a target of the last reality because it contained the zero point, the nexus of all realities. If they were able to control the zero point, the last reality would be able to fulfill their goal of complete annihilation much easier. This was the most important reality they've invaded so far. The war between Reality Zero and the last reality, the reality which created everything and the reality which will destroy everything, has begun. A war effort was funded on the island to fight back against the slowly corrupting last reality. While the islanders fight against the elite fiends, the cube queen in her golden cube form starts to travel across the island. She visited each of the other cubes which had landed on the island and activated them. The cubes began self-multiplying, creating smaller copies of themselves. Meanwhile, the blue cube the strike team rebooted lay dormant near the edge of the island. The golden cube travels to the center of the island and hovers over the zero point, building up its energy. The other cubes join her at the center and eventually form the Convergence, a giant pyramid. The cube queen finally reveals her true form, enclosing herself within a bubble above the pyramid, building her power further. She intended to make a giant rift to the last reality and engulf the entire island in the sideways, winning them the invasion. The cube queen summons the powerful caretakers to help in the invasion, and the islanders fight back even harder. While all this is happening, Io is planning a counterattack. Dr. Sloan studied alien technology at the Io's base in the formerly redacted bunker. The Io built a fortress near the Convergence, naming it the Guava Fort. It wasn't impressive at all, a ragtag effort. As the Cube Queen's corruption continued spreading over the island, things didn't look good for the islanders, but they could do nothing but fight on. The Cube Queen finally reached her full power, and using the Convergence almost like a giant rift beacon, opens a portal to the last reality. We see many ships the size of the mothership destroyed previously, and a massive ship known as the Cube's Cradle, the true mothership of the last reality. The real invasion has just begun. But the islanders were not alone. The purified cube teleported itself to Guava Fort, helping us fight against the last reality. The purified cube provided a shield around the fort to protect from projectile attacks and also heal the fighters. The invasion begins, and a large number of saucers come to attack. Luckily, the purified cube's shield holds up, and the islanders fight back against the invading force, but it seems like any damage done is negligible. The Cube Queen amps up the attack, summoning multiple caretakers to attack the fort, a force which would be almost impossible to fight back against. And when the saucers abduct the weapons of the fighters, the battle becomes a massacre. The purified cube's shield failed, and islanders are slaughtered both by the chimera ships and the caretakers, and when an abductor destroys a rebooted cube, all hope is seemingly lost. Meanwhile, underneath the island, the Io are being instructed to evacuate. However, Dr. Sloan still has old grudges to settle. She goes to John Jones' prison and tells him that she would execute him right then and there. She instructs her guard to commence the execution, but before the process is completed, the door is broken down by none other than the Foundation. He kills the Io guards and frees Jones. Surprised that the Foundation would come back to save him, the Foundation reminds Jones that he promised him Geno. The Foundation and the Seven have a plan to save the island from the last reality. The Foundation fights its way to the Zero Point Chamber, and he and Jones fight off waves of IO cards. The Foundation disables the gyro system and tells Jones to press a button, putting in motion his plan. The island lurches as it begins to tilt. The Foundation tells the Visitor and Scientist to start the second phase of the plan. Above ground, the Scientist and Visitor are searching for survivors. They find the people left alive at the Guava Fort, still under attack, and rescue them. The Visitor fights off several caretakers by himself, while the scientist breaks into a bunker and tells the islanders to follow in. He tells Visitor that he'll see him on the other side, and the Visitor flies away as the scientist leads the islanders into the bridge. He tells them to follow him as the island continues to tilt further and further. They meet up with the Foundation and Jones at the Zero Point Chamber in the center of the island and finish off the last IO guards. The Seven assure us that since this is the epicenter of the island, we should be safe as it flips over. The glass should also be able to hold under the pressure of the water, until suddenly a caretaker appears and starts to crack the glass. Now why can a caretaker swim this far underwater when cube monsters are weak to water? It's not explained and I honestly think this fact was just overlooked by Epic when making this event. But the caretaker breaks the glass and we are sucked far away from the island. We surface and watch as the island flips over. 
As the Cube Queen is submerged under the water, she is seemingly killed as the portal to the last reality is closed. All the invading forces are destroyed as the island literally falls on top of them. And the rotation is completed, revealing a brand new island, a brand new world full of possibilities. It required lots of sacrifice, but the last reality was now defeated, and life would go on in this new land. And while life on the new island was mostly peaceful, Io still controlled the zero point, and as long as this was the case, the people of the island would never find peace. And behind the scenes, another major conflict was brewing. For the first time in years, the Paradigm contacted the Seven, informing them that she would return. How will she be received by the other members? And deep underground, Dr. Sloan and the IO survived, and they built giant drills to make their way up to the surface. And when they make their way up there, the Seven would have yet another battle on their hands. Many years of struggle have passed, but it looks like many more are still in store for the people of Reality Zero. And as of right now, that should be the entirety of the Fortnite lore explained. Thank you for watching, and if you made it all the way through, I really appreciate your support. If you would like to support me further, please consider using my supporter creator code Rivetcha in the Fortnite item shop. Feel free to correct anything I got wrong or continue the discussion down below in the comments. And as always, please consider liking the video and subscribing. Thank you, and I'll see you next time.